Certainly appreciate that <coughs> introduction, Don. That was, uh, I wish my wife could have been here to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Our subject is worship, and uh, I think you all know that, or you probably wouldn't be in here. Worship is one of the most involved subjects in the Bible. And I want to tell you, if you want to study a subject in the Bible that you can get a firm grasp on from beginning to end in short order, you don't want to study worship because it is extremely involved. It involves many, many different aspects and, and, uh, and the how to and the what you do and, and the, and what is worship and, uh, so many things like this. And as you look in both the Old and the New Testaments, the more you study it, the more you will see how involved it really is. But at the same time, worship is a matter of obligation. And, uh, therefore, it's something that we must do if we're going to be pleasing to God. And so, we recognize from reading the Bible that God expects this of us, and therefore we read the Bible to find out what we're to do, and the more we read, perhaps the more we find out how deep the subject is. Now let me back off of that a little bit and say, uh, in order not to discourage anyone, that I believe you can capture the essence of what worship is uh, very easily, and you don't have to have a, a, a genius IQ to do that nor do you have to spend years reading in order to understand the simple, basic facts of worship. But when I said what I did at the very outset, I mean that there are things involved in worship that go far beyond what uh, sometimes might seem the simplest thing on the surface. We're going to look at some of these things tonight. It's, it's not a matter that it's difficult to understand. It's a matter of how to really interpret the scriptures in all of these various uh, passages that we have that relate to worship. Now, Jesus made a statement to the devil, and he said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And, of course, he was quoting the Old Testament. This is found in Matthew 4 and verse 10 in the New Testament. So it's important to know what worship is, and it's equally important to know how to do it acceptably. And uh, therefore, we need to uh, open our Bibles and get to the subject. I think if we were to take a poll, worship is something that everybody has heard about, but maybe if you would ask somebody to give a definition of worship, he might be hard-pressed to do it. And uh, he would be sitting there thinking, well, how, how could I put this? Uh, you, you, everybody thinks they know what worship is, but when you give a definition to it, that's where the problem seems to come about. And uh, and really, the, the more you study it, the more frustrated you get sometimes in trying to put a definition on it. Here's some definitions I gleaned just from a few uh, writings uh, that people have produced over the years. Number one, a spiritual awareness of God. Number two, adoration and reverence toward God. Number three, certain special activities, usually numbered five through which we honor God. Number uh, four, any act of service done for the Lord's work, such as teaching a class, doing visitation, visiting the sick, and, and uh, maybe even maintenance on the building and, and various things like that. And then number five, living one's entire life as a faithful Christian. In other words, everything you do from getting up in the morning and brushing your teeth to uh, uh, straightening the bed before you get back in it that night. Uh, would be worship. And uh, so <clears throat> we have all of these various ideas, and really these can be elaborated on. This is, I just tried to segment out the five major divisions, really, in the thinking. And in reading books and articles over the years, I've jotted down different definitions that people have given for worship, and I have found, I don't think I've ever found any two just exactly alike. And so it kind of makes me think there might be as many definitions of worship as there are people who have written on the subject. And so we do have a, uh, we do have a problem in trying to get a handle on just exactly how to define that. And uh, now, I would, uh, what I would like to do at the outset in this study, and I hope that uh, many of you, or most of you, or maybe even all of you, will uh, come back for the succeeding nights, because as was announced in there, we will be building 
where we leave off tonight, we're going to go on. But what I thought I would do tonight is uh, get to the, uh, uh, try to get to a definition of worship, a working Bible definition of work, worship, and the specific acts that are involved in this particular activity. What does the Bible say are those acts or those things or those aspects that are involved in worship? This is where I want to begin tonight. Now, uh, I'm, sometimes when people study this subject, they, uh, they want to say there is a great difference between the Old and the New Testaments on this subject. And usually, one of the prime passages, perhaps most often the first passage that anybody will go to in order to try to demonstrate uh, that contention is the discussion that Jesus had with the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. And uh, you recall that she, being a Samaritan, wanted to know who was right, the Samaritans or the Jews. The Jews saying Jerusalem was the place to worship. And she said, our father said, this mountain. And uh, she didn't name the mountain in the passage, but we know from history it is Mount Gerizim. And so the question is, is it Gerizim or is it Jerusalem? And Jesus said, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which ye know not, we worship that which we know, for salvation is from the Jews. So Jesus essentially said in, in, in that verse, uh, the Jews are right, the Samaritans are wrong. But he went ahead to say, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such doth the Father seek to be his worshipers. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And so the point is usually made on this passage, that while Jesus said the Jews were right, and Jerusalem was the place, not this Samaritan mountain, he went ahead to say that the hour is coming, and now is, when... All of this is going to be radically changed, and the whole concept of worship will be revolutionized. Now, that's how some have interpreted the words of Jesus. And uh, I brought some, some things to, uh, to quote from, if I can get, get these papers sorted out and, and, uh, and perhaps get the, uh, the right quote. Uh, here's one from a brother who said, Worship in the New Age is not to be limited as to time or place, as it was under God's former arrangement, but rather encompasses the worshiper's total life and relationship with God. And so, you see, what he got out of this passage is that it wasn't just that Jesus is uh, saying that Jerusalem is not going to be a special place any longer in the Christian age. But what he got out of, it, out of it was more than that, and that is to say that really everything you do is worship. But I want to uh, point out that when Jesus made these statements, he didn't say what some people are getting out of the passage. He didn't say, I'm going to revolutionize the whole concept of worship. He simply focused in on whether there is a holy place. And so when he said, neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem, and when he said that the Father seeks true worshipers to worship him in spirit and truth, he was. We, we are not to conclude that he was saying that we're going to just change the whole picture of worship, the whole concept of worship, and from now on, every single thing you do in life is going to be considered worship. That's not what he said at all, you see. That's reading far more into the passage than what Jesus actually said. What he did say was, we're not going to have a holy place any longer. So it's not going to be this mountain. It's not going to be Jerusalem. There's not going to be some one special holy place. Then he went further to say that God seeks people to worship him in spirit and truth. Now, the question is this. Is that a new concept? Is this something that, that Jesus uh, initiated, worshiping God in spirit and truth, something he initiated for the Christian age beginning right then at that time that Jews had never been taught? That's my question. And as we read the Old Testament, we'll find out the answer very simply, and the answer is no. There's nothing at all new about that. You know, it would seem to that a person, if he just used his common sense and what general Bible knowledge he has, if you were to ask a person, did God not require people to worship in truth in the Old Testament? In other words, they could worship falsely and that'd be all right. 
Well, you'd say, well, no, no, you couldn't do that. Well, did God not require people to worship in their spirit in the Old Testament? In other words, it would be all right if, if with their mouths they honored Jesus, with their lips they honored him, but their heart was far from him. As Jesus pointed out in Matthew 15, that'd be all right in the Old Testament time? Well, certainly not. And so, you know, you have to have the spirit involved in it, and you have to do it in the true and proper way. And that has been true in every age from the Garden of Eden on down. This is what was wrong with Cain's offering, by the way. And in fact, there, there was a double problem there, as I see it. Some have, in, in recent decades, have tried to say, well, it was only his attitude. I think he did have a bad attitude. I think he had a wrong attitude. I believe the New Testament bears that out in speaking about King, but I'll tell you something else. He didn't offer it by faith, and faith is man's response to what God has said. And that means either believing a promise God has given or obeying a command that God has given. You see, faith is man's response to what God has said. So King violated both the spirit and the action of what God required, and we can learn this from the New Testament. But... Uh, uh, when we read in this passage, worship God in spirit and truth, we're not reading something that is revolutionary because uh, here in the Old Testament, we have uh, long before this time, the, this requirement brought out for man to observe. I want you to notice, and I hope we have time to read some passages as we move along this evening. We have a lot of ground to cover if we get anywhere near through with what I have in mind. But in Deuteronomy 10 and verse 12, notice this passage. It's one of the, I think, one of the key passages of the Old Testament on this subject. And if you were going to mark notes in John 4, I would certainly mark this passage down in the margin there because it relates to it. What about the Old Testament in regard to this? Notice, and now Israel, what doth Jehovah thy God require of thee? But to fear Jehovah thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve Jehovah thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul. Now, who could possibly come along and say it would be all right to worship God in the Old Testament and not do it in spirit? Think? It'd be impossible to take that position. And so the, the passage makes it uh, abundantly clear. What about Joshua 24, 14? Now, therefore, fear Jehovah and serve him in sincerity and truth. And so sincerity is with the spirit, you see, with a proper attitude and not, not being hypocritical, not playing a role. You've got your proper spirit about you and do it in truth. And so this is required in the Old Testament time. What, therefore, is new and revolutionary by what Jesus said to the Samaritan woman? Well, actually, there's not a thing that is new about it in regard to the kind of worship that is offered. The only thing that he said that was going to be changed is the fact that there would be an elimination of that holy place. And the truth of the matter is, therefore, that God has never accepted the performance of perfunctory rituals in worship to himself. Micah 6, 6 through 8. One of, here's another one of the great passages of the Old Testament. And uh, it begins by asking questions. Wherewith shall I come before Jehovah and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with uh, burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will Jehovah be pleased with thousands of rams or ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn from, for my transgression, the food of my body for the sin of my soul? And the answer to all those questions is no, 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 no. And the next verse says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and, uh, and he says, what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Mm -hmm. And so you see that that's what's on, what's on the inside. You see, that's what's being emphasized there. And so this is a passage that should never be forgotten. Here's another favorite verse of mine, uh, Psalm 42 and verse 8. God will commend or command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, even a prayer unto the God of my life. It sort of captures the, the spirit, I think, of a one whose heart is devoted uh, toward God. Well, so, no, the answer to the question is no. The basic nature of worship is not changed. It was not revolutionized with the coming of the Christian age. And this is true even though the Old Testament and the Levitical ritual were abrogated and are no longer in force. 
So, we come to the next point then. Worship was always and still is involved with overt actions, acts that we perform. It's still involved with overt acts. It is, it is an act itself, and it continues to be so, and it is not simply an attitude or a relationship. It seems to me that uh, for 30 or more years, I have heard people say that we should have an attitude of prayer all the time, and that is their explanation of what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17. Isn't that right? Pray without ceasing. And they say, well, that just means have an attitude of prayer all the time. Well, I'm going to tell you, folks, I don't know what an attitude of prayer is. Now, I can read in the Bible about attitudes, plural, that make prayer acceptable to God, you see, that are conducive to prayer. We're going to discuss this before the week's out, by the way. Uh, like uh, reverence, submission, uh, humility, all these kinds of things. These are various attitudes that, me- that will help our prayers, that will cause our prayers to be accepted by God, but there's no such thing as an am attitude, singular, of prayer. And uh, we're either praying or we're not, in other words. Prayer begins and it ends. It has a starting place and a stopping place, and what is true of prayer is also true of any other uh, aspect of worship. And so this is something that I believe that some now are very uh, diligently trying to get away from. And uh, articles and various articles and and things have been written in recent years to the effect that uh, there is no starting place and stopping place. We don't go to a building to worship. Worship is is just continually going on 24 hours a day. Even when you're asleep, you're worshiping. And I want to tell you, I believe that is just as wrong as it can be. That worship does have a starting place, it does have a stopping place, and even in a so-called worship service of, let's say, 60 minutes, one hour, worship does not continue through that whole hour. It begins and it stops. And I want to tell you, regarding singing, here the song leader gets up and he announces a number. I don't believe anybody's worshiping at that moment. And people are turning their pages, and he may clear his throat. He may even have a glass of water and take a drink. I've seen him do that in times past. Boy, Wallace always, people used to give him a glass of water when he preached because he preached so long they figured his throat would get dried out before he was through. I heard him preaching on baptism one time, by the way, and that glass of water was sitting right here. There was a flat place on the on the pulpit stand there, and, and that glass of water was right there. Brother Wallace never moved very fast. He always moved very slowly. He'd pace back and forth. And even when he used gestures, you know, his arm would go rather slowly. And on this particular occasion, about halfway through this sermon, he made a gesture and his arm came over and knocked that glass of water and it started falling to the floor. And he snapped that thing up. I never saw an old man move so fast in my life. (laughs) Only about half of the water spilled out on the floor and he just set it back down. He was preaching on baptism at the moment, and he said, that's not sprinkling, that's pouring. (laughs) So, uh, these various things may take place, and the song leader may, uh, he may blow a note on a pitch pipe, or uh, the song leader uh, where we are in Rowlett, yeah, he likes a tuning fork, so nobody else can hear it but him, you know, and uh, none of this is worship. And then we sing that song, and then we stop, and worship stops until the next act of worship begins. And the next act may be a prayer, may be another song, you see. Worship is involved with acts, not just a constant 24-hour day running continuous attitude. And now we need to have a proper attitude toward God, but that's not, that's not the, the meaning of worship. Worship is something more than that. Notice, uh, let's notice some passages now and try to get in... Uh, Uh, as much of this as we can. Abraham said to his servants when he went to Mount Moriah in response to God's command uh, to offer Isaac his son, uh, Abraham and Isaac and some servant boys went and made that journey, and he said to his servants, you stay here, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. Genesis 22, 5. See? Well, if worship was something continuous, then Abraham was doing it all along that journey. And he he never stopped worshiping, and he, and he wouldn't be, he wouldn't begin to worship. 
because it would be going on all the time. Gideon worshiped and then returned to the camp of Israel. You read in Judges 7 and verse 15. And when he returned, that means his worship was over. And uh, the same thing is true of various other ones. Like in 1 Samuel 1 and verse 19, we won't have time to turn our Bibles and read all these, or, or I'll never get through all the material I want to do. So we will look at some, but not all. And I'll just quote these or paraphrase them, as the case may be. But Elkanah, um, and who was the uh, father of uh, Samuel, he... Uh, and his family rose up in the morning early and worshipped before Jehovah. 1 Samuel 1.19. Well, that means he wasn't worshipping while he was asleep, as some of our brethren have now started saying. Okay? He wasn't worshipping when he was asleep. He got up and the family worshipped. That's what the passage says. And then when they finished that, they were not worshipping any longer. David washed and changed his clothes. You remember the death of his son? He washed and changed his clothes and came into the house of Jehovah and worshipped, the Bible says. And then he went into his own house. 2 Samuel 12 and verse 20. And so in spite of these uh, modern objections, we find that worship does have a starting place and a stopping place. And also, what's involved in these objections are... Phrases that we have used over the years, like, let's go to worship, or did you come to worship? We might ask somebody, go to worship, come to worship, and, be, and, and now brethren have started saying, some brethren in some places have started saying, these, these phrases are all wrong. You don't go to worship because you're, you're doing that all the time, see? So you can't use that phrase rightly, but the Bible uses it. In Isaiah 66, in verse 23, we read of come to worship. The, the phrase, just those exact words, is right there in that verse. Zechariah 14, 16 has the phrase, go to worship. And the wise men who went to find Jesus because of ha having seen the star and, and, and somehow been given the information that uh, the king of the Jews was born, they uh, came to worship Jesus, Matthew 2, 2. And the Canaanitish woman that Jesus encountered came and worshipped Jesus, Matthew 15, 25. The Ethiopian had come to Jerusalem to worship. See? Acts 8 and verse 27. And so uh, here are some um, uh, passages that will show that these various phrases are correctly used as we have used them over over the over the years over and over in the psalms by the way we read of uh, many expressions like oh come let us worship and bow down let us kneel before jehovah our maker psalm 95 verse 6 by the way that passage right there verse 6 and 7 could be considered the theme passage i think of the entire book of psalms and, uh, and then here's another one, Psalm 86 and verse 9. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord. And so you see the progression. Did all of this change with the New Testament, though? See, somebody might say, wait a minute now, I noticed those were Old Testament passages you were quoting there. And see, that's all changed now uh, by virtue of the fact of what Jesus said to the Samaritan woman. So the question is, did all this change then with the New Testament? Well, I'm going to stop and actually read this one. Revelation chapter 15. Now, the New Testament has begun. The Christian age has begun. The, uh, the book of Revelation, no matter what date you put on it, was written late into the age or the life of the apostles. And so it had been decades since the Christian age had begun. And here John sees a sign in heaven. He has this heavenly vision of the throne of God, the sea of glass around that throne, and he says they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. That's where we get that expression, one of our songs, the sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by. Great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God. Here's what they're saying. The Almighty, righteous and true are thy ways, thou King of the ages. Who shall not fear, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all the nations shall come and worship before thee. So they had to actually 
<laughs> Some physical action had to take place there. They made a journey. They made a trip and they went somewhere and then worshiped God. And so this is after the Christian age has begun. And by the way, this is the very statement we just noticed out of Psalm chapter 86. It's a New Testament version of that very same thing. And uh, so there's nothing changed between the Old Testament and the New as to the nature of worship. Now, the specific activities that we'll do, yes, that changed. But I'm talking about the nature of worship and how that before it was comprised with acts and now it's just your whole total life. All of that is just as wrong as it can be. So when we read in the Old Testament that um, people bowed or bowed their heads or fell on their faces and worshiped, it refers to specific acts. And the same is true in the New Testament. In fact, Paul said when writing to Corinthians, he said an unbeliever will fall down on his face and worship God after he's come into your assembly. That's what he wrote to them in 1 Corinthians 14, 25. He will fall down on his face and worship God. You see, it's the very same, the very same kind of description that is given so many times in the Old Testament about such and such a person falling down and worshiping God. Specific act. And by the way, we went to the book of Revelation a moment ago. Let's go there again. I want to read three passages. Revelation 4 and verse 10 is one. Now, here's John seeing these, these heavenly visions, you see. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is current time in chapter 4. And uh, he sees the four and twenty elders in Revelation 4.10. He says, The four and twenty elders shall fall down before him that sitteth on the throne, and shall worship him that liveth forever and ever, and shall cast their crowns before the throne, saying, and then he quotes what they say. In chapter 5 and verse 14, notice this one. And the four living creatures. Now, here's some other heavenly beings up there besides those 24 elders. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. See? They fell down and worshipped. So it shows a specific act that is involved. Chapter 7 and verse 11 says, and all the angels were standing round about the throne and about the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying. So now you have the 24 elders, you have the four living creatures, and you have all the angels. And I think that's just about everybody up there, as near as I can tell. And they all did a specific act, and in the, involved with that specific act, they worshiped God. And so I think that it is amply demonstrated that the contention that we're hearing uh, so much these days is simply not true about um, the change in worship. But now let me get on to some further questions. What specific acts are mentioned in the Bible as being acts of worship? What specific acts? Uh, let me introduce this a little bit. Some have said, well, it's wrong to speak of acts of worship, as we've already noticed, because worship is only uh, an attitude or a relationship. And then others have said, well, worship is an act, but it is a mental act. It is wholly internal, wholly internal. Usually, brethren have said, worship is a specific act, and it's something external, and there are five such acts that we could put in the list of items for the Christian age. And you can probably recite those as well as anybody else. It would be either preaching or Bible reading. You could say preaching. Some have said preaching, or you could just say Bible reading, or you could say preaching and Bible reading, but I'll put all that in one, one category and call that one. And then secondly, praying, thirdly, singing, and then the Lord's Supper, and then finally, giving. And so these are the five acts of worship as people usually want to list them out in, in some version of that to get those same things across. Now, uh, denominational preachers will often add baptism into the list. And that may surprise us. We, I don't think any of our brethren have ever said that baptism is an act of worship. See? Why do denominational preachers say it then? Well, there's a very simple reason. Because many denominational preachers think you're already Christian when you are baptized. See? So to be baptized is like taking the Lord's Supper. It's a Christian activity. See? It's just something you do as an item uh, to, that God wants you to do as a Christian. 
And that's why they put it on a par with the Lord's Supper or singing or praying, something like that, you see. And that's why they think it's an act of worship. Uh, Alexander Campbell, not that Campbell is always right about everything, but he included uh, church discipline in the list of, uh, of items of worship. And then there have been those who have questioned one or more of these uh, along the way. And uh, sometimes people have even included fellowship in, in the idea of what worship is. Well, let's go to some specific things that I believe that we can find out by reading our Bibles and, uh, and seeing what is involved in worship. What time exactly are we supposed to be out? I'm not sure, Gary. Uh, I haven't been told. So. Okay. All right. Well, uh, let's look at worship and prayer uh, in the first place. Uh, the reason I asked that question is because the program says you start at 7.50 and end at 845, and uh, I noticed we started at 8, so I wondered if we're supposed to go 10 minutes longer. <laughs> but, uh, all right, let's look at worship and, uh, look at worship and uh, prayer. Over in Exodus 34, now this, this gets into some very interesting study, as far as I'm concerned. Exodus 34 and verses 8 and 9. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found favor in thy sight, O Lord, let the Lord, I pray thee, go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people. Well, I won't finish reading it. But he started praying, you see. So he he fell to the earth, or bowed his head rather, toward the earth, and worshipped and said. And what he said was a prayer. So here is worship connected with prayer, you see. And it, it is a, the specific type of prayer is a petition. He's asking God for something. Now, if we were to go to Isaiah chapter 44 and uh, uh, look at an element of idol worship, we can go to verse 17 of the chapter, which says, And the residue thereof, he maketh a god, even his graven image. He falleth down unto it, and worshipeth, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my god. So here's an idol worshiper. He falls down to the idol, and worships, and prays, and here's what he says when he prays. Okay. So you see the, the connection with prayer here. Now, one more on uh, on prayer would uh, let's go to uh uh second chronicles chapter 7 and verse 3 second chronicles 7 3 and all the children of israel looked on when the fire came down and the glory of jehovah was upon the house and they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped and gave thanks unto Jehovah, saying, For he is good, for his loving kindness endureth forever. So they bowed themselves to the ground and worshipped and gave thanks. Now, so here's a prayer involved here, and it's a prayer of thanksgiving in this particular case. Now, let's, uh, let's leave that one, and let's go on to singing. And I want to go now to the book of Psalms and read uh, chapter 66. By the way, the, the subject of worship is mentioned so much more often in the Old Testament. The word worship is mentioned so much more often in the Old Testament. We can get uh, so many more passages on any of these subjects from the Old Testament than we can from the New. And uh, singing is something that never changed from the Old to the New. So Psalm 66 and verse 4 says, All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name. Now, over in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, 2 Chronicles 29 and verse 30, says, Moreover, Hezekiah the king and the princes commanded the Levites to sing praises unto Jehovah with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. And they sang praises with gladness, and they bowed their heads and worshipped. And so you see the connection of worship with singing. Now let's, let's ask the question about Bible reading. And I think, as far as I can tell, and you may have a different outlook on this than I do, but as far as I can tell, you can put Bible reading and preaching in the same category. I don't see any real difference uh, between Bible reading and preaching in, 
at least in in a general way. Now we might get specific, and uh, there might be there might be an element of of distinction here somewhere along the way if we were to get real minute about it. But um, as far as the nature of worship goes, I mean, as far as discussing this subject goes, you see, I don't mean in in, in various other ways. Let's see, where am I trying to go? Nehemiah. Uh, I want to go to Nehemiah. I forgot whether it's in the Old and the New Testament. <laughs> no, not really. Not really. I'm about to find it here. I really need to put my glasses on. I'll be able to see these things a little better. Nehemiah 9 and verse 3 says, now here's what happened, you see, at the time that the people of God came back from captivity and they made a public confession of sin and so forth, they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of Jehovah their God a fourth part of the day. And another fourth part, they confessed and worshipped Jehovah their God. Ah, now that tells us something, see? They read the Bible for a fourth part of the day, and for another fourth part, they worshipped God. So that sort of tells me they weren't worshipping God during that Bible reading. Now, I don't know. You may get something different out of that than I do. But that's, that's what it seems to be saying to me. So, in my mind, I'm saying, well, then... You know, based on that passage, I'm not sure that we ought to categorize Bible reading as worship. Now, I might be convinced, and if somebody has something to counteract that with, uh, I'd be glad to listen to it. But And, and, and this is not a, uh, I want you to understand, this is not a dogmatic conclusion on my part. Uh, I'm still uh, open-minded about that. It's a tentative conclusion. And I'm thinking that this must be what this scripture is trying to say. There's a difference between Bible reading and worship. Otherwise, I don't know what to make out of the fourth part for doing one and another fourth part for doing the other. What about worship and giving? Now, here, uh, we also have had some disagreement over the years. In fact, uh, even back in the, into the days of our uh, pioneer preachers, there was some disagreement over whether giving ought to be included in the list of items of worship. Because, after all, it, it, it may not be worship. It may be simply an act of service. And uh, so let's, let's look at some passages before we even offer any other uh, comments on it. Uh, De uh, Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verse 10. And now, behold, I have brought the first of the fruit of the ground, which thou, O Jehovah, hast given me. And thou shalt set it before Jehovah thy God, and worship before Jehovah thy God. And by the way, the next verse says, And thou shalt rejoice in all the good which Jehovah thy God hath given unto thee. So, now here is, um, here is giving, you see, bringing of the first fruits and setting that before God. But I'm wondering here as I read this, thou shalt set it before Jehovah thy God and worship before Jehovah thy God. See? And thou shalt rejoice. So I'm wondering now, does that mean three different activities? Offering the gift and then, and then worshiping and then rejoicing. Or are we supposed to understand that as the first two items sort of get wound up together there and they're done simultaneously, and it's all one thing, so to speak, and you, the, the, you give the gift and you're worshiping at the same time, and so that the giving is an expression of that worship. You, you just ask yourself the question in your own mind, and we won't stop to answer it right now. First Chronicles chapter 16, First Chronicles 16 and verse 29, this uh, same uh, passage is found in Psalm 96, verses 8 and 9. Verse 29 says, Ascribe unto Jehovah the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship Jehovah in the beauty of holiness, the King James says. The American Standard says, in holy array. So now notice it again. You ascribe unto Jehovah the glory due to his name. Well, that's praise. And then you bring an offering, that's giving. And come bring an offering and come before him. And then the, the final statement, worship Jehovah in the beauty of holiness. And so right in the same breath, so to speak, you have the giving and you have worship mentioned. But again, I'm I want to let you ask your, your own mind the question, are uh, is that to be put together or or are those two separate things, the giving and the worship? 
Uh, here's something for a little food, uh, for uh, perhaps it'll give you some food for thought, and that is what the wise men did when they came to see Jesus in Matthew chapter 2. Uh, so when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men came from the east and so forth, and they wanted to find out where Jesus was. And uh, so finally, you get down to verse 11 of Matthew 2, and they came into the house. And let me interrupt my point to make another point. They didn't go into the manger. No, there weren't any wise men in the manger. All those nativity scenes you saw this last Christmas out in people's front yards are all wrong. They didn't go into any manger. Several months had gone by since the birth of Jesus. They went into the house where he was staying. See? No wise men in the manger. They went into the house and saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down. Let me interrupt myself again. The angel wasn't up there in the air. The angels weren't up there in the air when they said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. An angel of the Lord stood by them is what you read. Well, let's get back to the read. I thought I just couldn't resist talking about that. And they came into the house and saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. All right, see, the first thing they did, they came in. There he is. There he is with his mother. She's probably holding him. Maybe he was lying there on something. I don't know. But at any rate, what they did was they just fell down and worshipped him. That's the first thing they did, see? They fell down and worshipped him, and opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So they fell down and worshipped him, and then they got up. Obviously, they got up from falling down so that they could open up their bags or whatever they had those gifts in and uh, bring them out and give them to him. Uh, I have no idea. I have no idea. Uh, I guess uh, we could ask the little boy that I asked in a Bible class one time, I guess it wasn't a Bible class, but it had all the little kids down front before we, before Bible classes convened, we sang those kiddie songs for a few minutes, you know, and, and I asked him a few Bible questions and, and about the forbidden fruit, and I said, was it an apple or a pear? And one little boy hollered out real loud, it was a pear, he said. <laughs> I don't know where he got that. You should have known it was an apple. That's what people said all those years. But uh, anyway, no, I have no idea how many gifts, but there are obviously three kinds. I don't know that we should be real insistent that there weren't three wise men. There could have been three. <laughs> we just don't know how many there were. Well, at any rate, now here's the question to ask. You ask yourself. I'm not going to answer all these things for you. This is to stir up thought, see? Um, does this mean that they fell down and worshipped him, and then when they got their gifts out and gave him those gifts, is then that not worship because what they did first was worship and then they stopped worshiping and got the gifts and gave them the gifts. In other words, then is giving to be separated from worship. See? Now that's a little that's a little food for thought. You're going to get as frustrated as you can be because here I'm going on to the next point now. And uh, let, me, let me do this. Uh, boy, time keeps moving on. Uh, in order to, to stir your thinking a little more on the subject of giving in connection with worship, let's go back into the Old Testament and talk about worship and sacrifice. Was sacrificing worship in the Old Testament? Well, let's look. Second uh, Kings chapter 17. Second Kings chapter 17. And verse 35 and 36. Uh, we're jumping into the middle of a sentence here. With whom Jehovah had made a covenant and charged them, saying, All right, Jehovah made a covenant and charged them, saying, Ye shall not fear other gods, nor bow yourselves to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. All right. So, not fear other gods, nor bow yourselves. Now, bow yourselves is just the translators using different words to translate the same word that so many times in the Old Testament is translated worship. It's the very same word. So we could just translate it that way right here and be just as right. Uh, so uh, fear no other gods, nor worship them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. Does that mean sacrifice then was separated from worship? See, that's the question. Now, as long as we're in 2 Kings, let's look at the next chapter, 18 and verse 22. But if you say unto me, we trust in Jehovah our God, is not that he, he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away? 
and hath said to Judah and to Jerusalem, ye shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Now, see, here's, a, here's an idolater's defiance to the nation of Israel. He's running down good King Hezekiah for taking out the idolatrous high places. And he said, look, I, I, Hezekiah took down all those idolatrous altars, and he said, you have to worship before that altar that is in Jerusalem. Well, that's true. That's what he did. Well, how do you worship before an altar? See, that's what I'm getting at. How do you worship before an altar? What do you do in order to worship before this altar? And then 2 Chronicles 32, 12 mentions worship before one altar and burn incense upon it. I won't stop to read that one, but it, that's what it says, to worship before one altar and burn incense on it. But there's an and in there, see, and so you have to ask yourself a question. Is that two separate things, or is that all one thing? And then uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah uh, 26. Jeremiah 26 and verse 2. Thus saith Jehovah, stand in the court of Jehovah's house and speak unto all the cities of Judah which come to worship in Jehovah's house. Now here's my question. What did they do in the Lord's house that God considered worship? Was it, was it incense? Was it animal sacrifices? Was it, uh, what did they do there? What did they do? They obviously worshiped in the Lord's house. The question is, what did they do while they were in there? Revelation 11, by the way, in verse 1, in a, in a figurative passage, obviously figurative, speaks of uh, measuring the temple and them that worship in it. Those who worship in the temple, see, is what it says. And then, uh, but back to the Old Testament, in uh, 2 Samuel 12 and verse 20, I won't bother to, bother to read this one, but it speaks of David in the temple worshiping. And 2 Chronicles, though, 7 and verses 3 and 4 seems to bring out a distinction. I'm hurrying along because I have to and the time is short. 2 Chronicles 7 verses 3 and 4. And all the children of Israel looked on when the fire came down and the glory of Jehovah was upon the house and they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks unto Jehovah, saying, see, now we read this a while ago. And uh, so here you, you, is Solomon, you see, this is the, the dedication of the temple. And I, I guess I should have read verse 1. When Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering, see, that's what you have, first of all, and the sacrifices. And the glory of Jehovah filled the house. The priests couldn't go in. And all the children of Israel looked on. And when the fire came down, they bowed themselves on their faces to the ground and worshipped. So was the sacrifices, was the burning of the sacrifices worship, or did they watch that and that was done and then they fell down and worshipped? That's my question. All right, now here's a real great passage in Second Chronicles 29. 2 Chronicles 29, verses 27 through 29. This is full of interesting material. We read verse 30 of this passage a while ago. And Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of Jehovah began also. Now they had the offering going on, and while it was going on, the song of the Lord began. The song of Jehovah began also. And the trumpets. Remember, they had instrumental music back then. It was, uh, it, it was uh, God-given. No doubt about it. The Bible states it plain as day. It isn't today, but it was then. And so, they, and so they had the trumpets. Together with the instruments of David, king of Israel, and all the assembly worshipped, and the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded, all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. So they did all that while the burnt offering was going on. And when they had made an end of offering, the king and all that were present with him bowed themselves and worshipped. And so here they had a burnt offering, and then they bowed themselves and worshipped. Well, now that sounds like maybe you separate it, you see. But on the other hand, let's go back to Abraham that we started with back at the beginning. Genesis 22, 5, and I'll try to wrap this up quickly. What did he say to those servants? I and the lad will go yonder and worship. And what did they do when they got up there? It, it was an offering, wasn't it? And so now, what are you, you try to figure this out. Well, in some of these passages, 
the, it seems to be distinguished. Worship from sacrifice, and then you look at Abraham, and it seems like it's the same thing. And then you read Psalm 50 and verse 23, and you read about a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And then you go to the New Testament, 1 Peter 2, 5, and you read about spiritual sacrifices that we as priests offer up. And then you read uh, 1 Samuel 1 and verse 3, which says to worship and sacrifice. And so you wonder, is all this to be distinguished? Now, I didn't have in mind to end right on this note because we haven't covered praise. But I'm not going to hold you over because I think maybe the thing to do is to quit. And uh, so we will begin at this point tomorrow night and talk about praise, and I will offer you my thoughts, um, remembering, I want you to remember, that they are perfectly fallible. <laughs> There's no infallibility here, but I'll offer you my thoughts on these various subjects that I didn't answer Amen. just now. Thank you, All right. Appreciate your tips.